بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد ومبارك وسلم one question or this not exactly related but it, i can use it to illustrate another point was that there was a part 2 to this question that i discussed yesterday which was about fatwa and taqwa and i mentioned that taqwa is sometimes used to try to raise yourself to a level where you are even more pleasing to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala however there are some times you might overdo that so the questioner has given an example that there's certain it's a questioner from the uk so there's certain flavorings in the food items there artificial colors artificial flavors artificial preservatives and the fatwa says that there is no haram ingredient in them and therefore they are permissible to eat not all of them there must be some certain set of such additives that have been deemed to be permissible but then the questioner goes on to suggest that would it be taqwa for me to stay away from them anyway because i can obviously eat other things to actually no taqwa is not in leaving that which is absolutely permissible so say not rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said and this is actually i can illustrate a lot of concepts from this al halal bayyinun wal haram bayyinun that that which is from a sharia perspective from an islamic law perspective permissible that will be clear wal haram bayyin and that which is prohibited will be clear wa bainahuma umurun mushtabihat and between the two there will be some doubtful matters and taqwa lies in leaving those doubtful matters here if there's agreement that those ingredients are don't have anything haram in them so it's not doubtful you should not doubt it right just because of even you know once there used to be a fatwa that pepsi is haram allah akbar kabira so i heard this from an eye witness so i didn't witness it myself so i'm give you my sanad that i heard from a person who happened to meet mufti taqi usmani in the airport and he went up to him in the airport and he met and talked to him and greeted him and he sat down and invaded his time and personal space and started asking him questions he khas tabir apna na invaded his time and personal space and started asking him questions no allah wala maybe he asked him that you know mr sa if i have a few questions since i caught you hmm do you think i can ask allah wala i don't know that part of the story i'm just teasing you people so he asked him that one of the questions he told me he asked him that you know there are some people who are saying uh pepsi is haram so i wanted to ask you what's your fatwa on this he said okay wait he called the waiter where i don't remember what country of the world this was he called someone probably pakistan and he ordered a pepsi he ordered a pepsi the pepsi came and then he stood up and he drank the pepsi standing allah akbar kamina now this extra because normally it's sunna to eat drinking down strictly speaking that is also sunna ghair muqadda if you want to tag it with the labels of the fuqaha means if you drink standing up you don't get any sin but you missed out on the opportunity to perform that same mundane act of drinking in a way that resembled your beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and remember every sunnah is mahwubiyah but you don't incur sin so the point was mufti taqi usmani was trying to physically demonstrate that not only is drinking pepsi halal it's not even makru in the slightest way that you should think that taqwa demands that i shouldn't drink it no right and to illustrate that he even drank it standing up all right so the point is that that is not taqwa taqwa would be in number 1 uh to if there's a disagreement amongst the scholars about something being permissible all right now this doesn't mean that in all such cases you leave it because like i told you that also life would be unnecessarily difficult just like you cannot pick and choose mix and match by always choosing the easiest position just like that taqwa does not mean that you pick and choose and mix and match by always choosing the most difficult position so if there is something that's doubtful which you sh- or disagreement rather between the scholars as to its permissibility you have to go with the scholars that you trust that's the first not instant reaction what taqwa means i should leave it so another good contemporary example is quote unquote islamic banking and finance i said quote unquote because actually what it means is halal riba free western capitalist exploitative banking it doesn't really shouldn't be called islamic it should be called riba free 
interest-free, but Western capitalist exploitative banking. All right? But some people, there are some ulama who disagree, and they say, no, it's not interest-free. It's not actually interest-free. Others say it is interest-free. Now here, Dean does not teach you that you should just, okay, I will go with whoever is giving the more strict opinion, because this is something that's not about you personally, this is a public matter, societal matter, right? So the decision can't be based on this. So what an individual has to do is you have to see which one of those two scholars, sets of scholars you feel more confident in their position, right? Third example would be, okay, third aspect I will say about this, and then I will begin because it leads into this topic very well is that one is a mufti and another is a sheikh. What that means I will explain to you today. The job of the mufti is to identify what is halal and haram in sharia. Alright? The mufti's job is not to identify what may be doubtful or permissible but has an effect on your spirituality. The sheikh will know that. For example, our mashaykh they say, that if you eat outside food, it can, not necessarily will, but it can have a negative effect on the spiritual condition of your heart. What does it mean spiritual condition of heart? On your ability to make the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll give you two examples historically. There was a great sheikh, his name was Imam Rabbani Sheikh Ahmed Sir Hindi Rimulatana. You will learn more about him in the afternoon session. He had a son by the name of Hazrat Khwaja Muhammad Masum Rimulatana. Ma'asum because he was extremely, un- exceptionally, unusually pious even as a baby. So it's written about him that if they wanted to know if the month of Ramadan had started or not, one year there was a difference of opinion in the moon sighting. So they said that see, is this baby Muhammad Ma'asum, is he drinking the milk from his mother or not? Because his mother narrates that the first year, because it's two years that you drink milk as a baby. In the first year, my baby never drank milk from Fajr to Maghrib from me in the month of Ramadan. Allahu Akbar Kabira. This was just the baby's thing. He wouldn't. I tried to give him, because obviously the baby doesn't have to fast, but he refused to drink in his infancy, few months old. So now it was, he was now one year and three, four months old, and there was a difference of opinion as to whether the moon had been sighted. So people were wondering, should we fast or not? So they said that ask, send some woman to ask the mother of Muhammad Masum that is he drinking milk from you this morning or not? If he drinks the milk, we'll say that the moon was not sighted and you can still eat. And if he doesn't drink the milk, we'll know that the moon was sighted. This is what is written about this baby. Now this ability in him of being so pious was leading to difficulty when he was six, seven years old. So another incident that happened in his life when he was seven years old, he would stand in front of the masjid and he was arranging the people's shoes, putting some on the left, putting some on the right. So then one, his father sent one of his students to say, find out what is Muhammad, this boy Muhammad Masum doing. So Masum said very sweetly that I am putting the shoes of the Asabul Yameen on the right and putting the shoes of the Asabul Shamal on the left. So because this level of piety and perception was not going to work out well for this young boy, so when this father, Sheikh Ahmed Sir Hindi, was told of the answer, he told the student that I want you to feed the food of the market to my son for the next few days. Next few days, instead of the home-cooked food, they fed the food of the market to the son. All of this perception left the son. I'll give you a contemporary example. There's a mother son, a samba, that I won't take its name for certain reasons. Uh, this was an incident of 1995-96. So there was one young boy who, mashallah, he went in Jamaat al for the four days annual break. And he came back on fire. On fire means he came back extremely pious, praying to Hajjud. And so what he started doing was, he started waking up the other children in the hostel of that madrasa for tahajjud. Now waking somebody up for fajr, that's something else. And waking someone else up for tahajjud, when they didn't ask you to do so, that's something else. So then the other students, they went to the principal, and they complained that Fala X is waking us up for tahajjud. 
and we're falling sleepy in class all day, and it's affecting our studies. So he called Exit, and he said, why are you waking them up for attention? He says, I, I'm myself, I'm not waking up by setting an alarm. I automatically wake up at the time of the hajjad. And I wake up at that time, I see so much nur and fez and spiritual emanations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that my love for my fellow students demands me. I, I cannot help but wake them up so they can also rise and make dua to Allah this moment. And okay. The Muftim narrates, that for the next three days, instead of the madrasa food, we fed him the food from the market. Tanjit finished. <laughs> His own tanjit finished. Now these are things of practical experience. This is something I'm going to be explaining to you towards the end and this morning session and the afternoon session. So our mashayikh, sometimes they understand what? That there are certain things that are permissible, but they have so much ghafla in them so much absence of the remembrance of Allah Ta'ala, that what it leads to in a person's heart, not necessarily sin, but it leads to a person's heart also getting the absence of the zikr of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Or not praying tajjud is not a sin. Right? Okay? So the mashayikh would be able to guide a person on that. So it doesn't mean a person themselves think that, okay, I will stop eating the candy that is artificial color, that's my taqwa. No, actually that eating that candy will not have any negative spiritual effect on your heart. That's not one of those things to leave in order to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As this example I gave you, unnecessarily or excessively reading outside cooked food can have a negative spiritual effect on your heart. One reason for that is that maybe the person who cooked the food was not in a state of wudu. Maybe they don't pray salah or they commit gross sins. They're openly disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So such food lacks barakah. And when you constantly do something that lacks barakah, it affects your heart. For example, if I were to suggest to you that this particular business lacks barakah. For example, Pakistan Tobacco Company. Now, like I told you, strictly speaking, the fatwa on cigarette is in its initial stage as makuwa tanzihi. So if some boy asks me, is it permissible to work in a salaried employment position at Pakistan Tobacco? Yes. Fatwa is yes. But there's no barakah in the work of this company because they manufacture and sell cigarettes, right? So your earning won't have barakah in it. So even the absence of barakah is something that can lead to an absence of barakah in your heart and in your life, okay? So for those things, uh, beyond fatwa, what may I do and what I may not do, that is something that you need to ask the mashayikh if you're interested in that. Don't try to self-regulate yourself. All right. So that brings us to this question, now slide number four. What exactly are mashayikh and what is this whole tradition of spirituality and Sufism? Now there are different words in Arabic and different words in English. So understand in vocabulary point number one, that deen of Islam is concerned with realities, we're not concerned with labels. So for example, this garment that I'm wearing, for the man in front of me who can see me, it is what it is. You can call it jubba. You can call it galabiya, you can call it tamiz, you can call it kurta, you can call it long baggy shirt. You're changing the name, the label, the description, the name or label does not change what it is. It's a reality. So there's a certain reality in our deen that for lack of a better word in English, I'm calling it spirituality, it means spiritual purification. The Arabic word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used in Qur'an to describe this reality is tazkiya. Tazkiya. So tazkiya means purification. But it's not talking about your outward purification. That's tahara. There's another word for that in Arabic. That's the purification of the zahir, of the outer form. Tazkiya means purification of your batin, purification of your mind from bad thoughts, purification of your nafs from unlawful desires, and purification of your heart from inappropriate feelings. So that's called tazkiya, purification. Then there's another aspect, the other words in Qur'an, so it's not just otherwise, it just said purification. By spirituality, I mean number one, tazkiya, purification of the inner self. Second, there's a notion in Qur'an of the dhikr, of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Now there's a certain type of zikr which is fard, like praying salat in order to remember Allah Ta'ala, fasting to remember Allah Ta'ala. But Allah Ta'ala in Quran mentions another aspect of zikr which is not fard. But that zikr is done out of love. To get qurb, to get near to Allah Ta'ala, to get more near to Allah Ta'ala. So zikr would be remembrance. So first step is purification. Second is remembrance. Alright? Just like that, there are a few other words in Qur'an. Alright, so all of, and I'm going to be showing you some of them, all of that combined I'm calling spirituality. So the contrast is basically that which, legality is about your outward behavior. Legality is about your outward actions. Spirituality is about your heart and your desires and your mind to align that with the will and wish and pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm calling that spirituality. All right? Okay. But again, it doesn't matter what word you use. The point is that the reality, the content is in the Quran and Sunnah. A second thing is that something, sometimes it happens in language. And the way uh, this is called, let's use an English term for you, usage. So sometimes a word is used in a way that it's not its original dictionary definition. For example, chair. So chair in English means this object that me and you are sitting on. But when this word was used in the university and academia, the word chair meant the head of the department. Now, that use of the word chair is not in the original English dictionary. That was the new usage of the word once it became part of a particular vocabulary, the vocabulary of the university. All right? Okay. Some second point is that sometimes a word changes over time. So the reality is the same, but the label that people use to represent that reality changes. So for example, Allah Ta'ala said in Quran, Quran tartila, that you should recite Quran in slow, methodical, proper, pronounced recitation. So the word that Allah Ta'ala uses in Quran to represent correct slow, methodical, proper recitation is tartil. You will not find the word tajweed anywhere in Quran and you will not find the word tajweed anywhere in the hadith. However, all of you know that it's just something, it's a matter of usage that now in istimal, in usage, in urf, in customary practice, everyone across the ummah calls the study and learning and practice of proper, correct, methodical recitation of Qur'an, they all call it tajweed. Very few still call it tartil. And in fact, only in advanced kirat do they then actually use the word tartil for something else now, which is incorrect, but they use tartil for the long recitation. Right? So you can get, for example, three editions of uh, the recitation of Qur'an by Qari Hudayfi. One is hadr. Hadr means the fairly fast recitation that is normally used in daily salah. Then is tartil, and then is tajweed. So they then now use these terms in a totally different way. So sometimes a term is used for different things. Now if I invite you to come to tajweed class, and somebody tells you that show me the word tajweed in Quran and Hadith, and you can't do that, and then the person says tajweed class is bidah. Is this a correct statement? No. It's not a bidah because the content and subject matter of that class is in the Quran and Hadith. Is it a bidah to change the name? If you think so, instead of calling it tajweed, you should only call it tartil. Then, you know, pretty much the entire tradition of Quran recitation for the past few centuries is guilty of bidah. So you will have to learn from Ahl bidah. <laughs> you can try to convince them to change it, but their own teacher was from the Ahl bidah. So your sanad in recitation will ultimately, inescapably go through Ahl al-Bidah, if you choose to call this a bidah. So just like that, tazkiyah is the word Allah Ta'ala used in Qur'an. Later in the Arabs, it started in the time of the Tabai Tabin, the word tasawwuf was used. Now why would, was the name changed? The name was changed because tasawwuf was actually based on a few other words, that gained more prominence in currency in use in the Arabic language. Just like Tajweed gained a wider usage. So one word is Safa. So Safa also means purity. The same meaning of Tazkiyah. That's why in Urdu you word Safai, that comes from the Arabic word Safa. 
Then there was another word related to the suf. So the plural of suf is suf. Ashab sufa. They were the people of the raised platform or the bench. Now who were they? They were those sahaba, not all sahaba are in this category. They were those particular sahaba who now chose not to work, not to earn a living, not to do anything except live right in front of, to camp out. You can say in front of the hujra, at the rear of the hujra, of say, even if you go to Medina, you will see this, how close they were. In the rear of the hujra, the single room residential accommodation of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they decided to spend 24 hour, 24 seven there. And learn and practice, learn and practice, learn and practice. So what happened was, this is from the Sahaba, and this is in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Sayyidina Rasulullah allowed them to do so. So that's also Sunnah. Sunnah is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and what he did, and what he allowed. So this Sunnah practice, this would be called the Sunnah, the Sunnah practice was continued in the time of Tabin and Tabai Tabin, again by a select number of people for a limited time. So then in the Arabs, they started using a word to describe those people who were doing the same thing that the Ashaba Sufa did. So they started calling them the people of like Sufa. Then this word became combined, Safa from the Tazkiyah, Maybe there was just somebody who liked to play with words and said these are people who are doing tazkiyah, but they're doing it the way the Ashabu Sufa did it, that they're dedicating some part of their time to this full time. So why don't we take this other word, close to tazkiyah, Safa, purity, and we'll just call it the Sobuf. People do that in language. Language is constantly evolving. So they called them Mutasawwifu and the Ahlit Tasawwuf. Okay? So Tasawwuf means that tradition of the people who pursued the path of Tazkiyah by following the same Sunnah method of the Ashab Sufa. Alright? Okay. Now what was that method? That method was now at the same time, I'm telling you verbally that I'm going to run through some of these things in the slides with you. At the same time, Sayyidina Rasulullah wasallam said, What? La Rahbaniya. La Rahbaniya to fil Islam. A Rahib, Rahbaniya means monasticism. A rahib is a monk, or the female equivalent is a nun. A rahib is that person, not for a limited time, and not for the goal of purification, no. As a view of life, that this is my way of life. Not one, two years, not 40 days a year, not four months, no. My whole life I will spend, not earning, not engaging, not participating in society, and my whole life I will disconnect and only do the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is not allowed in our deen. And the Ashab Sufa did not practice that. And the proof is that when Nabi Karim Sallam passed away from this world, that's it, this, this assembly was finished. They didn't stay there. <laughs> they dispersed and they taught and they did dawah and they brought so many people to Iman from the Tabi. Alright? But yes, there was a certain period. So that won't be called monasticism. So there's another Arabic word for that. This occurs once in Quran and Surah Yusuf. It's called Zuhud. Zuhud. So in English, sometimes they call it asceticism. So in our religion, there is no monasticism, but there is asceticism. Zuhud means that, okay, in order to fix myself, in order to purify my heart and my mind, in order to become a person of zikr, in order to get all these teachings which I'm calling spirituality, tazkiya, zikr, qurb, haya, taqwa, sabr, shukr, akhlaq, to get all these inner realities of Islam, I need to make a dedicated effort. Like the Ashab Sufa made a dedicated effort. I don't have to do this my whole life, but I have to make a dedicated effort. Tell the different ways that that dedicated effort could play out. There's no single way and there's no single preferred way. One way was, okay, I will take 40 days out and I will spend 40 days doing this in a dedicated way. The basis for that was in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam to him for 30 days and then 10 more, 40 days. So there was a notion that, okay, there is some number in Quran that what constitutes a sufficient amount of time. So for Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, 40 days was sufficient for becoming a Nabi. Maybe 40 days will be enough for me to become a Saleh Mu'min, a Zakir Mu'min, a Mutaki Mu'min. But this is not necessary. It's not required. It's not even preferred. You can't even say that doing it for 40 days is preferred over 35 days. But it is a method. A method. 
There's another mention of the number 40. And a Hassan, Hassan Hadith, now you should all know what that means. Hassan Hadith means can be perfectly used for anything in Sharia. Hassan Hadith, that Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu said, Man akhlasillahi arba'ina, that that person who dedicates themselves solely, exclusively to Allah Ta'ala for 40 days, Allah Ta'ala will make the springs of wisdom gush forth from his heart. So because of these two things, one of the methods of these people was to do this for 40 days. But there were many other methods. The notion was, however, rather than the amount of days, the concept that this requires some type of full-time dedicated effort. It may even be something like once a week for two hours. It may even be something like that, right? But the notion of it requires some full-time dedicated effort, I'm not going to become okay just along with the rest of my life, right? Just like, for example, if a person wants to study ilm, or wants to become a hafiz of Qur'an, that requires to take out some time and dedicate that exclusively to that memorization. So to take out some time and to devote some effort exclusively to this spirituality, purification, zikr, etc., that was called zuhud. And this is a practice. This is how the Saba and Tabin and Tabai Tabin understood what the Ashab al Sufar were doing. So the people who were doing that same thing, dedicated Zuhud, they were called the people of the Sobaf. Then this notion of Zuhud, you find it again in the time of the Tabai Tabin and the Muhaddithin. They started gathering, if you remember the first thing was the authors of topical collections. If you remember what I showed you yesterday, the very first activity. Very first was Sahaba's personal writings. The Tabin, then they did topical collections, right? So in those topical collections were collections of hadith on Zuhr. Two of the most famous ones which are still printed and taught today is Kitab al-Zuhd of Abdullah bin Mubarak, ta'ala, and Kitab al-Zuhd of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. Some ulama view it's rightly attributed to Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, and others view it as more properly attributed to his son, Abdullah ibn Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Rahmatullah alayhima, may Allah Ta'ala send his mercy on both of them. Alright? Unfortunately, I have to clear your air and build your concepts, otherwise all five days I could have taught you Kitab al-Zoda, Abdul Mubarak, I have it, Mazata. But the <laughs> first day you would say, what is all this bidah? Why should we trust ulama? I have to clear the air for you before I can do the real fun part with you. What can I do? <laughs> right? Okay? Zohd. Zohd. Disconnect from the world. Be distant from the world. In order to go deep in your connection to Allah Ta'ala, you need to be able to deeply disconnect from the world. That's one aspect of it. But there are many aspects of it. The core content of the teachings found in Quran, Hadith, life of Prophet practice of Sahaba, practice of Salaf. The method can be open. That will bring us to another topic. But let me first begin and show you just a few of the slides before I begin the second topic, which is about methods. All right? Okay, so this notion of Tazkiyah, Allah Ta'ala said in Gankad, Aflaha man zakkaha. So here this is a long passage in Surah Al-Shams. Allah SWT takes seven kasam, so in slide number five, right, washamsi wa dohaha wal kamari idha talaha. Wal layli idha yakshaha, wal nahari idha jallaha, وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَنَا بَنَاهَا وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا تَهَاهَا وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَكْوَاهَا Seven customs then قَدْ أَفْلَهَا مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا So Allah swears on seven things, right? The sun, the moon, the day, the night, the heaven, the firmament creation, which means universe, outer space also, and the earthly, the firm creations, and then on the nafs, which Allah Ta'ala himself fashioned and Allah Ta'ala inspired it with that which was foul for it and that which was virtue for it. After taking these seven customs, Allah Ta'ala that indeed successful and triumphant is that person who does tazkiyah of their nafs. So tazkiyah to nafs is a Quranic concept. In another place, Allah Ta'ala said, Qad aflaha man tazakka. Indeed successful is that person who does tazkiyah of their nafs. All right? Now, falah is essential for us. Falah means you will be successful on the Day of Judgment. Falah means you succeed in your deen. Falah means you succeed in earning the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala. Falah means you get Jannah. So this isn't something that's optional. 
Nobody can say, no, I live my life without falah. And I want to enter my grave without falah. And I want to be raised to Allah Ta'ala and Dejan without falah. So tazkiyat to nafs is fard. Tazkiyat to nafs to purify our batin is fard in our deen. This was the second side, six kal aflaha man Alright. Then, side number seven, a verse if you sit with us, you know we recite frequently. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَلُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهُ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ So the only person who will succeed on the Day of Judgment, the day, the Day of Judgment is a day that no one's wealth, property, possessions will be a benefit to them at all. No one's children, worldly relations will be of any benefit to them at all. The only one who will get falah on that day is the one who brings to Allah Ta'ala a pure heart. So now, tazkiyah of the nafs and purity of the heart. Two things that are fard. At least trying to do it is fard. Success lies in the tawfiq of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. These two things are fard. Alright. Side number eight. Allah Ta'ala said, وَذَرُوا ظَاهِرُ الْإِثْمِ وَبَاطِنَا That leave all the sins that you do, ظَاهِرْ and batin, the outward sin and the inner sin. What are the outer sins? Ilm al-fiqh, ilm al-shariya will tell me. What are the batin sins? The ilm of tazkiyah and tasawuf will tell me. Alright? Obviously, Quran and Hadith are the sources. But who is going to tell me? Right? So the shaykh is going to be the one who takes the lust out of my heart, the envy out of my heart, the pride out of my heart. The mufti will be the one who makes sure that I pray properly, my financial transactions are proper, my contracts with my employees are proper, my marriage is valid, etc. Alright? Okay. This is also fard, because this is a command from Allah Ta'ala. Wa dharu, wa and dharu. Allah Ta'ala commands that you must leave all outward and inner sin. Slide number nine. This I already done for you earlier when we did the session on Sunnah that this is one of the prophetic functions. So I will just show you that one word here. وَيُزَكِّهِمْ And the Prophet wasallam, he will do their tazkiyah. Now the first aspect of them is Sahaba Ikram. That Sayyidina Rasulullah will do the tazkiyah of Sahaba. But actually this is about the entire mission of Nabuwa, so it means for the entire Ummah. Now Sayyidina Rasulullah will not directly do tazkiyah of the Ummah, but he will do tazkiyah of the Sahaba, and he will also, the Prophet will not directly recite the Quran to us, but he will recite it to Sahaba, and this will continue generation to generation. Every aspect of Nabuwa mentioned in this slide, in this verse of Quran, will continue from generation to generation. Sahaba will get all four directly from the Prophet ﷺ. Sayyidina Rasulullah directly recites Quran to them. He directly purified their heart and batin. He directly explained the meanings of Quran to them. And he directly explained Sunnah to them. Tabin received it through the wasita, through the single intermediary means of Sahaba. Tabai Tabin received it through two wasita. This will continue, each of the four will continue generation to generation to generation. That's why if you remember the hadith, the sahih hadith I showed you earlier, a few days ago, al-ulama'u wa rasul anbiya, that the ulama are the inheritors of the prophets and what? In this mission. So now there must be ulama who recite Quran, they're called qari. There must be ulama who do the third function, they teach Quran, they're called mufassir. There must be ulama who teach and understand, so it's hikmah, the sunnah. They're called muhaddithin and fuqaha, and there must be ulama who do the tazkiyah, they're called mashayikh. So this understanding is clearly from the Qur'an and the Sahih Hadith. <coughs> Alright, next slide number 10. I'll leave that for you. Next slide is number 11. Alright, the sunnah model. So the first question is, do we know how did Sayyidina Rasulullah himself do Tazkiyah of the Sahaba, then we will try to follow a model of Tazkiyah for ourselves that most closely resembles the Sunnah model. So the first aspect of that Tazkiyah was Suhba. Suhba to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Simply by being in the presence and the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba's batin was purified, they reached that zikr of Allah Ta'ala, and they got the qurb of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now me and you, we can't replicate that. We can't get sober to Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So question, 
that well, Allah Ta'ala, you've also given me the deen, and you gave the Sahaba the deen. The Sahaba did their tazkiyah through Sobat Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What am I supposed to do? So look at slide number 11, Surah the Tawbah, which is Surah 9, verse 119. What does Allah Ta'ala say? Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O now each and every person who will ever believe until the end of time, ittakullaha have taqwa, وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ Sahaba had صَوْبَةُ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم After them, people will have to go for صَوْبَةِ الصَّادِقِينَ You must be with the صَادِقِينَ Same model of Tazkiyah. So this is the Qur'an and Sunnah model of Tazkiyah is through companionship, through صَوْبَة. Now can you imagine how flawed and how against the Qur'an and Sunnah that person and their methodology is who tells you for deen you don't need people. And for what part of deen? Now, this was Tasawuf and Tazkiya to get taqwa. This isn't about ilm, this is about taqwa. Remember? Taqwa is the goal of Islamic spirituality. All of Tazkiya is for taqwa. All of zikr is for taqwa. All of hayah is for taqwa. All of qurb is for taqwa. Taqwa is the ultimate. That's why if you remember earlier, I would tell you aql and nafs versus ilm and taqwa. Aql and nafs versus ilm and taqwa. Aql versus ilm. Nafs versus taqwa. You want to get taqwa. You want to get ilm? I've already explained that to you. Why the basis of Quran and Sahih Hadith of taking ilm from ulama? Now this, the basis of taking taqwa from the sadiqeen, it's in Quran. So somebody tells you, no, no, you don't need a shaykh. You can learn taqwa by reading on your own. So what should I read? You should read Quran and Sahih Bukhari. So okay, I read Quran, I came out, I was here. I heard Quran, Allah, Allah told me that you get taqwa, kuna ma sadiqeen. Try it on the person. Hmm? Then you will see. <laughs> Hmm? They will do what we call in English willy nilly and dilly dally. You don't know what that means. <laughs> they will willy nilly and dilly dally on you. Hmm? And you should see how fast they go over this ayah when they do the Dora Quran. Yevi, you will see. <laughs> the speed at which this is just transition only move. Hmm? And obviously if you sit with me, they will also say, and I accept it, you should see how slowly he does this verse in his Dora Quran. I accept it also. Yes. <laughs> Allah huh. Akbar. Hmm? But it's the same model of Tazkiyah. So Sahaba, Sohba, me and you, Allah dinamnu, Sohba. Sohba for what? For the Taqwa. So somebody says, oh, you know, I go and spend time with Shaykh, so it increases me in Taqwa. Oh, this is Shirk! Now, if you didn't see this ayah, they can convince you using Akal. They won't give you a Quran, Hadith argument, they will give you an Akal argument. This is Shirk. Taqwa comes from Allah, brother. What are you doing? What do you think? You're worshipping the shaykh? So you can find, no, I didn't, I didn't, I don't remember doing any sadza towards him, I don't remember doing rukut towards him, but this person is talking very, they're very emotional, they're emotionally charged. What are you worshipping the shaykh? You start getting confused, you're young, you get confused. Why do you let them slander you? You didn't worship anybody. Did you do ibadah? Have you done ibadah of me in the past four days? But that's how they'll talk to you, that's akal. The same people who say, show me the hadith, they don't show you any hadith. They just use their akal to convince you. It's all akal. This is shirk, brother. You must turn to Allah Ta'ala directly. There are no intermediaries. Allah Ta'ala said, La Rabbaniyat, the Prophet, La Rabbaniyat of Islam. Don't go to these people that they're like monks. Right? Same model. So who follows this model? Who is following the Quran and Sunnah model of Tazkiyah other than the Mashaykh of Tasawwuf? Who says this? Come and sit in my soba. Who says, come sit in my majlis? Who says, come sit in my bayan? Who is offering that? The mashayikh? They're the waris. They're those ulama who are waris of the function of tazkiyah. Okay? To show you some hadith, Nabi Akarim Sam also mentioned about suhba. The Prophet Sam said, Al-mar'u ala deen khililihi fal yandar man yukhalil a person is on the deen of their intimate friend. Oka Makal salam. The person, the person is on the deen of their friend. So each and every one of you should consider, do nether means, not or do see, you should consider carefully whom you make your khalil, your intimate friend. Remember, Allah Ta'ala calls Sayyidina Ibrahim Alayhi Salaam, Khalilullah. Khalil means intimate friend. Who do you deeply, regularly, continually associate with? Who is your Khalil who do you confide in? Who is your Khalil who are you confident in? Who is your Khalil whose advice do you accept? That's called Khalil. So the Prophet said, a person will be on the deen of their Khalil. 
This all say hadith? So now this hadith is in two ways. Number one, don't be deeply connected to bad company. Because if you have a friend who drinks, or you have a friend and she has boyfriends, and she's always talking to you about her boyfriends, then it rubs off. These things rub off. Hmm? This is another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The company rubs off when you sit with the person who sells itter. At least you will emerge fragrant with the itter. And you sit with the person who works the furnace, the hadad, the one who's working the iron furnace, you at least will get some heat. There's so many sahidith on this topic. So a person says, Oh, you know, I went to the bayan of Sheikh and I felt a boost in my iman. Oh, brother, this is Sheikh, Sheikh. Your iman isn't based on the Sheikh. Don't go to these bayans. He said, what should I do? I should read Sayyidith. So you read Sayyidith and say, but the Prophet told me to go to the person who sells fragrance so I get some fragrance. What happened? <laughs> right? What happened? So sohbah, companionship, Quran and Sunnah model of tazkiyah. All right, so if we want to follow tazkiyah, spirituality, tasawwuf, zikr, qurb, haya, akhlaq, we will follow it from the Quran, Sunnah, model. This is the future one. Second, second is that you must ask. You must ask and inquire. There has to be a learning relationship. So, first I can show you from hadith, sahabah karam, there's no single hadith, all the, many, many hadith are like this. Sahabah karam used to ask the Prophet some questions. There's one sahabi, I didn't put that up for you because that will shake you a little bit. One sahabi told Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi sallam that sometimes I get such thoughts in my mind then it's more preferable to me that I be cast off a mountain rather than I share what I'm thinking with you. I'm so ashamed of those thoughts. It's more preferable to me that I be cast off a mountain than I tell you those thoughts of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi sallam. But he was, what, he was asking for guidance. He was asking. Not for information, knowledge, fatwa. He was saying, I need guidance on this purification kurb. When other sahabi went to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa he said, I, I'm not able, I can't afford to get married. And I have uncontrollable desire. And I can't control it. So what did the Prophet tell him? He said, you should fast. <laughs> Marry if you can. And when he said, I can't, he said, okay, you should fast. But what was the sahabi was asking? He was presenting his situation. This is sunnah. This is an exclusive to the Prophet. Now you should look at the other way. This is the way of the Sahaba. Even the Sahaba needed somebody to ask. They'd flip you and say, no, no, that was only the Prophet ﷺ. And you, you shouldn't. No, no, brother, just read the hadith. You'll be guided. Don't. You don't need a shaykh to ask and get advice from. They flip it for you. That's twisted. Look at the Sahaba. Look at the other way. The Sahaba needed someone to ask. And they're not alone in that need. If the Sahaba, who got to see the Prophet who got to hear Quran recited, they needed somebody to ask. So you don't think the rest of this Ummah and next generations will need the same thing? You need somebody to ask. That this is when Sunnah Ma'ala of Tazkiyah, they used to ask, they used to inquire, they used to present and share their spiritual condition, their spiritual problems, and ask for guidance for that. Okay, now the Quran will show you that we're supposed to do that. So I've already done this for you. Fasalu ahl dhikri in kuntum la ta'lamun. So one meaning I told you was ahlul ilm. Right? The second meaning of this is ahlul zikr means the zakirin, salihin, mashaykh of this ummah. Now that's kept simply by keeping the knob at zero. I had to turn the knob a little bit to make it ahlul ilm. Right? But when I put the knob at zero, the lexical meaning, lughu imana, is ahlul zikr, the people who remember Allah Ta'ala. So what would it mean in this case, in kuntum la ta'lamun, if you don't know how to feel Allah Ta'ala in prayer, ask the people of zikr. If you don't know how to lower your gaze, ask the people of zikr. If you don't know how to increase your taqwa, ask the people of zikr. If you don't know anything about tazkiyah, zikr, qurb, all the topics of spirituality, akhlaq, haya, zikr, ask the people of zikr. So sahabah kram, they asked the Prophet Sallallahu many sahidith established that, we're being told in Quran that we should ask the people of zikr. So second part of the Quran and Sunnah model of tazkiyah, first was association, deep companionship to the level of khalil. So to go back to that, people say, oh, you know, the, uh, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, I'm, I'm not against so much the concept of taking a teacher, but you know, they're too into the shaykh. It's a cult. It's a cult. Allah Akbar. And he's a cultist leader. Do so you say, why? Why? Why is he a cultist leader? Because we've observed that they really love the sheikh. Okay, I'm going to do this for you also. 
So their problem is that some student, I'm talking about spiritual, don't get me wrong here, right? That they're just in the boys, they're the boys, they're, they're too fond of their sheikh, this has become a cult. Okay? So in deen, what were they supposed to do with the sheikh? I'll show you three things. From all from Quran and say, number one, kunu. They were supposed to be with him so intimately that kun fayakun, Hishan sab, kun fayakun, kunu, their very being. They were supposed to join their very being with him. Allah Ta'ala want, he wants to make something into existence. He says, kun fayakun, being it becomes. So Allah Ta'ala told him they had to be like that. Second, how, what were they supposed to take him as? As their khalil. al mar al I already told you that. So they're supposed to confide and be confident and share with them. That's also from say, that Sayyidis. Third Sayyidis. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there will be seven categories of people who get the shade of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the shade of Allah's throne in their judgment. One of those are al-mutahabuna fillah, that those who mutually loved each other deeply for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Quran and Sayyidit are describing this relationship as deep continual association interaction, deep confidence and learning, and deep love for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, such that a person will be forgiven on the Day of Judgment. Now if you want to call that a cult, that's your choice. It is what Allah Ta'ala and His Messenger Sallallahu described it to be. And Tabin had that love for Sahaba, Tabai Tabin had that love for the Tabin, and it doesn't end there. The students of Imam Tirmidhi had it from Imam Bukhari, Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani had it from Imam Munifa, Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziyah Imam Allah Ta'ala had it from Ibn Taymiyyah. This is there. This is there in our deen. Alright? Okay. So, ittila and su'al. Ittila means to inform about your condition and inquire and ask about it. Right? So I gave you examples of that from Hadith here. Alright. I have already explained some of you. Third, third, we are slide number fifteen. So, third aspect of the model of taskia is ittiba. So, when you inform and ask, you have to follow what you are told. So, this is another thing people say. They say you must listen to the sheikh. I don't know secret teaching. I tell you point blank, you must listen to the sheikh. I have no shame in telling you that. But in what? Not in something that is disobedience to Allah Ta'ala. You must listen to the shaykh's instructions when he's instructing you on the path of getting closer to Allah Ta'ala. I have no shame in saying, you must listen to the professor. What does it mean? If somebody registers for my course as a professor, what do I tell them? Look, if you want to register for my course, you must listen to me. What does that mean? This is the reading packet I've made. You will do these readings. These are the classes and lectures. You will attend these lectures. These are the essays. You will write these essays. This is going to be the exam. You will write this exam. If you listen to the professor, this learning will be successful. So what will somebody say? This is a cult. I walked into class and the professor said, I have to listen to him. I have to read what he put in the reading packet. This is all cultish behavior. This is a university of shirk and bidah. I'm dropping out. <laughs> huh? Foolish. It's all akal arguments. There's no delil. I'm amazed at the people who claim they're on delil. They just talk to you on the basis of akal. And you get misled? Hmm? So obviously, okay, they, then they will try another thing on you. That no, ittiba is only for the Prophet ﷺ. That was Sahaba. They had to follow what the Prophet told them. So look what Allah Ta'ala said in Quran, Surah Luqman verse 15. What tabay sabila man anaba ilayya? What tabay do ittiba? Follow. Sabil, that whole path. Tariqa. <laughs> Man anaba ilayya, man of every such person, anaba ilayya, who turns to me in inabat, inabat ilallah, who has yearning, longing, love for me. Allah is telling us in Quran, you follow the path of those people who turn towards me. So who are those people? They were the same kunuma sadaki, and the same sadaki, and I told you to be with them. Why would you be with them other than to ask and learn, and confide, and be guided, and follow their path. It's all a structure. This is the whole workshop that I'm making for you. It's an all interwoven structure, all from Quran and Sayyidis. I'm not even going to bring anything else in front of you. Although I explained to you yesterday that Sayyidis is not the only source of Sunnah. Right? Okay? That was the third part. I gave you this example of 
tajweeds, don't get confused by the word. Alright. I told you this about Kitab al-Zuhud. To the gatherings of Hassan al-Basri and the Tabin, I told you about him, Sayyidina mm-hmm. sent him to Basra, is clearly recorded in the fact, I just read it again two, three days ago. Clearly mentioned in his biography. In the daytime he would teach Quran, Hadith, Fiqh to the people of Basra. And at night he had a majlis. This is the word. And this word is also in Hadith, by the way. There's a Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim also in your collection of Riyadh al if you read that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends angels searching for the majalis of zikr. This is the word. Majalis of zikr. <laughs> the word majlis of zikr is in the Hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. Those gatherings and places where people sit collectively to remember Allah Ta'ala. This is another myth that you were told. Look, if you want to remember Allah Ta'ala, you do it individually. There's no need for collective zikr. So what's this hadith and who are the angels searching for? So I don't want to be from that group and sit in that group which is remembering Allah Ta'ala collectively that the angels are sending the mercy for. That I can show you, I have it on the other PowerPoint. So maybe I'll do it for you in a little bit or in the second part. Alright, if you want to see it. This house explains your Rahmani asceticism. Alright. Now the notion of khalwa, the notion of khalwa, even before you look at the slide number 19, uh, there's a sunnah itikaf in the last 10 days of Ramadan. That's here in slide number 19. So what does that mean? That even Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam began this practice of itikaf, means seclusion. Right? To seclude oneself from the world, and engage in full-time, dedicated learning, study, worship, about the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not for one's whole life, but for a certain period. So there is a sunnah, zuhud, that's the last ten days of itikaf. Second, there's another sunnah, which was when Sayyidina Rasulullah wa but before he became, before his nubuat was manifested, before zuhur and he used to go to the cave at Mount Hira, the cave at Mount Hira, and just reflect upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now here the Muhaddithin and Fuqaha have a difference of opinion. Those acts that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu did before Nabuat was opened upon him, do those constitute his sunnah or not? So the more correct answer is no. They don't constitute the sunnah in of themselves. In of themselves. However, we do learn lessons from them. So a very important example I'll give you, other than the city, to show you people did drive lessons from it. Sayyidina Rasulullah at the age of 25, he married a woman by the name of Ummu Mu'mineen Sayyidina Khadija, who was much older than him. So people take this and say that it is also acceptable in deen to marry a woman who is older than you. Strictly speaking, the Prophet did it before he heard Iqra Bismillah, before his nubut was manifested, but it's taken as an understanding. It's taken as an understanding. All right? In any case, I already gave you the example of the Ashab al-Sufa because some people say, no, it's just for the 10 days of Sunnah itikaf. No. Sayyidina Rasulullah allowed Sahaba Akram to voluntarily self-select themselves for this, that they will be from the Ashab al-Sufa and they will take out time and some did it for two full years that they will dedicate themselves purely to the worship and remembrance and learning of deen. So that is actually the hadith that establishes it generally. And obviously, but that's not sunnah, that's nafil, right? That's nafil. But it is, has value. It has value and benefit in deen that is established from the sunnah. Alright. Let me do this for you. Now, what are the goals of the sawwuf and tazkiyah and purification? So broadly speaking, there are five goals. So those were the methods, right? Some of the methods that we gave you. Companionship, informing, asking, following the guidance, confiding, loving, all of those things. Now, what are the goals? Number one goal is to leave all sins entirely. This is the first goal, first step. First and foremost, And this obviously requires a lifetime of effort, because even if a person is able to successfully leave a sin, they may still be desi- have desire and temptation for it, so they have to keep scrubbing. Now imagine tasky is like scrubbing. You have to keep scrubbing such that the desire and temptation goes away. But still, it's never done till you enter your grave because at any time you might be tempted by that sin again. There is never a moment where you can say I'm beyond desire, beyond temptation. Any time it could happen again. 
So you keep scrubbing, you keep scrubbing, right? You keep scrubbing. Now, what, another way you can think of it is health. So let's say a person was ill. So they go for treatment and they become healthy, but now they want to stay healthy the rest of their life, so they do daily exercise. Now, they also know that daily exercise doesn't mean I would necessarily never get sick again, but they know that daily exercise will, inshallah, lessen the sanctions of sickness. So that's why the people, they would do daily tilawat, daily durchrif, daily zikr of Allah Ta'ala. It's their daily spiritual exercise to keep them spiritually healthy. Right? So it never ends. Never think there's no maqam. The goal of tasawwuf is to leave sin entirely. What I was telling you here is you can never reach a level where you are now quote-unquote sinless and now you have reached some level. This is the point to tell you. So the goal is never reached. And so you could reach it. I mean, and obviously, because like the fullah nafsan illa wasaha, to Allah ta'ala said, it's also in our wasa. This is also in our ability to leave sin. Right? But we can never know that and we can never be content with that because it always remains in our ability to sin. <laughs> That's also still there. Right? Okay? Second goal is to, rather I would change the order here, second goal is to bring your iman to the level of yakin. Yakin means that if I lock you up with an atheist for 1,000 years and he speaks and you're silent non-stop for 1,000 years, he can't even put one single dent in your iman. That's called yakin. Alright? Yakin means that no matter what horror, what catastrophe, what test, what trial, what tribulation may afflict you, it doesn't put one doubt or one drop of skepticism in your iman. That's called yakin. Yakin. So now, although we have iman, you want yakin, this is also something that comes on this path. Yakin. Third goal is to have Feelings in your worship. I'm going slightly different order than side number I'm on side 21, slightly different order to get feelings in your worship. What does it mean? Number one, I prayed salah. Okay, you followed the commandment in Sharia. Problem, but I don't feel anything. So because I don't feel anything, was my salah invalid in Sharia? No, no. Sharia is still saying your salah is valid. You have to go to the other department, Tazkiyah, they're going to help you in how to get the feelings in salah. Sharia's job was to tell you how to pray. The physical postures, verbal recitations, ahkam, etc. So how to get the feelings in salah, to get the feelings of Quran, to get the feelings of tawaf. <laughs> yeah, I've physically been there in Makkah Makarama and people have literally come to me in the Torah room, Shaykh, I just came back from tawaf, I didn't feel anything. It's a problem. <laughs> it's something to be learned. <laughs> I just came back from Sa'i and I couldn't make dua all the time. I was thinking about worldly things. I was just walking. Basically, I just walked. That's all I was able to do. I want my say to be more than just walking. <laughs> I want it to be feeling. This is this is this is tazkiyah. This is what happens. The book of fiqh. You take an Umrah guidebook. There are some mashaykh now who do write these things, but the fiqh of Umrah doesn't teach you how to get the feelings of tawaf and say. This is a different department. This is tazkiyah. We use a key him. This is tazkiyah. This has to be learned. This has to be learned. So all worship. Shaykh, I, I can't make du'a. I make du'a, I just roll off the recite, the memorized Arabic words. I have no feelings when I make du'a to Allah Ta'ala. I know I should be crying to him, but I can't cry. I can't shed a tear. This has to be learned. This is taught. Alhamdulillah, this is taught. Alright? Fourth goal. Fourth goal is to adopt virtuous traits. What does that mean? Okay, Alhamdulillah, I'm staying away from sin. But now I want to have more haya, more sabr, more sugar, more tawakkul, more kanat, more love for Allah, more fear of Allah Ta'ala. I want more, more. I've fulfilled the duties of sharia. I brought myself in the permissible. Now I want to move to the preferable, move to the ideal. The books of fiqh won't tell you that. The books of fiqh will tell you do not lie. Tazkiyah will tell you how to be even more truthful. How to be even more truthful. Fik will tell you lower your gaze. Daskiya will tell you how to have even more haya. How to have haya of the heart. Fik will tell the woman to cover herself in terms of dress. But she may not have the haya of the heart. Recently I gave a talk at a university. Again, I won't name it. No, it wasn't that one. There were a lot of girls who, mashallah, were wearing headscarves. 
But so many of them were sitting and talking to boys. <laughs> I once, with my own eyes, saw on a university campus a girl with a headscarf sitting in the lap of a boy. I saw it with my own eyes. Uh, but what does it mean? She learned to cover her head, her hair, from legality. But she hasn't learned the high heart because she wasn't a student of spirituality. All right? And me walking by also had no effect on her. That's a statement you can understand or choose to misunderstand if you want. That's also something. Raz, I give you an example. There was a girl at another university who, once there was a boy who called me, I was walking and in that university there were two paths I could take to the masjid. So he was standing there, he said, sir, sir. So I walked towards him. Prior to my walking towards him, there was a girl who was talking to him. When I started walking, she saw me walking, she took her dipatta verse walking and put her on her head. So that was some inner haya that she had. She didn't have outward haya, but she had some inner haya that came in, uh, came into play at that moment. This other one, she has outer haya, she didn't have inner haya that came into play at that moment. Alright? I remember at one university, the very first exam I proctored, I was also stunned that when the adhan took place from the masjid, so many women, they started putting the dupatta over their hair. So I said, there's something there then. <laughs> That's inner haya, there's something inside her. <laughs> but after a few years, that number was less. <laughs> I wonder if I was to go today, maybe nothing would happen when the adhan takes place. Alright? So there's an outer haya, there's an inner haya. So to increase these virtuous traits, to increase in virtue, adopt virtue, increase virtue. So to rid humili- uh, arrogance, but to get humility. To remove stinginess, but to get generosity. To remove envy, jealousy, but to get the well-wishing, considerate nature. To remove anger, but then also to get gentleness. This is the goal of Tazkiyah. This is part of the training. This is part of the training. And the fifth part of the training, which is number five and the slide number 21, is to feel the qurb and ma'rafah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's what I did for you before, partly in our identity, for in the qareeb, Allah ta'ala's qareeb. You should feel that qurb. I want to feel that qurb. Hu ma'akum ayna ma'kuntum. Allah ta'ala says, is with me wherever I am. I want to feel this ma'iyya. I want to feel it. I want to be aware of Allah ta'ala. I want to be conscious of Allah ta'ala at all times. This you learn through taskiyah. These are the goals. Alright? So, another way, there's so many ways I could explain. There's no one exhaustive list. Sometimes I give an even shorter list. I just tell people very simply, taqwa, sunnah, haya, zikr, akhlaq. I just make it simple. Taqwa, sunnah, haya, zikr, akhlaq. So what does it mean to take a sheikh? Sheikh is the one who guides me on how I can get more taqwa, follow more sunnah, have more haya, do more zikr, and have better akhlaq. That's my shaykh. What does it mean to take an alim? He's the one who guides me and teaches me to get more knowledge of Quran and Hadith and Sunnah. That's my alim. So that's my alim and that's my shaykh. These are just instructors. They're not goals in of themselves. They're means. They're means. Alright? Okay, slide number 22. So how does a person get these goals? Before I do that... I want to switch a little bit here to history. Go ahead, put an Arabic one so you can't understand it. Switch to history. All right? Some historical questions that arise is, number one, rather, I want to go straight now. Actually, I think there is some slide over here. Aha. Bida. The word bida. I didn't give it. It's somewhere here. Where is it? Here you go. This is a very, very famous hadith of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a slightly longer version in the Muslim Imam Ahmad. There's a slightly shorter version. Kullu bidatun dalala. It's a very slightly version, right? So Sayyidina Rasulullah said that beware of every muhdath means everything that is new. Beware of everything that is all matters that are new. Why? Because everything that is new is a bidah, and every bidah is a dalala. So the last part, wa inna kulla bidatin dalala, that every bidah is dalala, uh, every innovation is going astray, is manifest error and going astray. Alright, first thing. First mistake that is made is what people do is they don't show you any even part of the workshop, they just show you this one hadith. 
that you have been trained, you should know by now, nothing in my deen is going to be that simple as it all comes down to just one hadith. But this one hadith and even the shorter version, just the last three words, Kulli Bidatun Dalala, just that has been so broadcast, so spread, as if it is the sole defining understanding of what it means to do something new. Alright? Okay. So let me show you another hadith. Sahih Muslim. Man sanna fil islami sunnatan hasana faluhu ajraha. Sahih Muslim. Let me show you some more of the workshop. Sayyidina, hmm? same thing. Sayyidina, same thing. Sayyidis. That's all Sayyidis. Many Sayyidis. Each and every person, man means each and every person who establishes a tradition, a sunnah, who establishes a tradition. So obviously I'm talking about the Prophet himself, but he else, a new sunnah. Now sunnah means strictly now in Islamic vocabulary, in Islamic vocabulary, what the Prophet did. But in Arabic vocabulary, in terms of lexical meaning, it means to establish any practice and tradition. To establish a practice and tradition. To anyone who establishes a practice and tradition in Islam, that is what? Sunnat and Hasana, a noble, virtuous practice and tradition, Faluhu Ajraha, that person will get the reward for that tradition and practice they established. Wa Ajru Man Amila Beha Ba'duhu Min Ghayri. And, and, Ba'duhu, and the person will get the reward of every single one in the future who adopts that practice and tradition without it decreasing their own reward in any way at all. Allah Akbar. And at the same time, وَمَنْ سَنَّ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ سُنَّةً سَيِّئَةً And anybody who brings a new practice and tradition, but not one that is hasan, one is سَيِّئَةً, one that is evil, wrong, incorrect, they will be... Uh, uh, they will bear the burden for that, and they will bear the burden of anybody and everyone who acts upon it thereafter. Now when you combine these two things, what does it mean? So Sayyidina Rasulullah, and there, there's more, right, on this topic, right? What you will come up with is refined understanding of new. So, muhdath is the different word over here, all right? Muhdathata, muhdathatatil, muhdathatil umur. Alright. The way this has been understood. Now remember in the workshop is you want to come up with a way to reconcile the hadith. You don't want to end up the hadith are contradicting with each other. Best way is to come up with it reconcile. So the way that you reconcile this, and Imam al-Shafi is also, this is his method as well, not just the Hanafi method. This is actually the Hanafi Shafi Maliki method. Imam Ahab bin Hanbal disagrees with this is what? That there is something called content in deen and there is something called method. Sunnah here means method, practice, tradition. So method, practice, tradition is one thing and content, content, knowledge, meaning is something else. So what does it mean? That if anybody adds any new content in deen, that is wrong. But if Anybody adopts or invents, literally invents mansanna, anybody invents a new method, a new practice, a new tradition, a new methodology to arrive at existing content in deen that is not called a bidah. So the difference is, is it content or is it method? So now I'll give you examples. So for example, every single tafsir written by every single mufassir, is a method of understanding the meanings of Qur'an. And it is a method that is not thabit. Thabit min Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is not, cannot be attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, let me give you the other understanding of bidah. So there are two rival understandings. One is the one I told you. The other one, which I feel is the incorrect one, but is the one that Ibn Taymiyyah and contemporary Salafis adopt, is that any method that is not attributed to, this is their claim, that they say bidah is also this, not just the content, but any method that cannot be attributed to any method or practice that cannot be attributed to the method and practice of the Prophet ﷺ is bidah. And the rest of Ahl-Sunnah wal says that any content 
that cannot be attributed to the Quran or Hadith is bidah, but any method or practice or entire tradition or entire methodology, read methodology, madhab, tradition, tariqah, silsila, method, practice of zikr, any method, practice, tradition, methodology will not be judged on whether it's attributed or found in the Quran and Sunnah, it will be judged whether it is khilaf a Quran or Sunnah. Now understand this again. There are two separate things. One is content, one is method. Simple terms. Content means content, knowledge, meaning. Method means method, practice, tradition, methodology. Two things, content and method. Two separate tests. For the test whether any, for content, when you want to test whether content is bidah, the test is that is this content found in the Quran and Hadith? If it is not found in Quran and Hadith, if it is not established from the Quran and the Sunnah, it will be called bidah. However, when you want to test method, as in method, practice, tradition, methodology, you won't use that test, you will do a different test. Not is it found in the Quran and Hadith, is it khilaf, khilaf is shara, Khilaf to the Quran and Sunnah. Is there anything in it that contravenes, contradicts, is contrary, is in opposition to the Quran and Hadith? This was the understanding of Ahmad Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Allah Ta'ala, it's not 100% clear what position he took. Ibn Taymiyyah, Allah Ta'ala, took that other position I told you, and he suggested this is also the position of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Allah Ta'ala, but that is open to debate and discussion and disagreement. Alright? Okay, now let's take the Salafi position of Bidah and run the box on it. So for those who are new again, run the box means we take a position and now we will, number one, try to look at did the position incorporate the whole workshop? Did the position incorporate all the arguments and evidences that are in the workshop? Or by accepting the position, I have to somehow not accept something in the workshop. And the second thing was we have to flush out the logical implications and consequences of the position and see if there's something unacceptable in that, then I won't be able to accept the position. Okay. So we take the Salafi position that everything that is not found in the Hadith and Sunnah in methodology, method, practice, tradition is to be called a bidah and is that very same bidah that is Dalala. Alright, so let's run the top part of the box. Let's look at this Hadith, slide 39. What are they going to do about this Hadith? which is crystal clear, it's not by turning the knob, that's another thing, that those meanings that come from the text on the workshop without turning the knob means it's clear, cut, meaning you cannot discount it, especially when it comes from such an authentic source like Sahih Muslim, and there's no Sahih Hadith that directly contradicts it. So the Prophet said again, any and everyone who invents a new method, practice, tradition in Islam, and that method, practice, tradition is hasana, is noble, virtuous, means it's a, a hasana means not against Quran and Sunnah and Sharia, and hasana means it actually enables a person to get that content and goal, then that person will get the reward for it. And everybody who follows them afterward, this is also establishing, this is why I said the word tradition. So for example, if Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, rahimullahu ta'ala, made the zikr of Allah Ta'ala in a particular way, and that way of zikr is not in any way against the Quran and Sunnah, and that way of zikr was hasana, that it enabled people to feel more feelings for Allah Ta'ala in their salah, outside their salah, then he will get the reward for that method of zikr, and everyone who follows him thereafter till the end of time who adopts that method of zikr, which is hasana, he will get the reward for all of those people who did zikr. I'll give you another example. Imam Bukhari developed a method of identifying a hadith as sahih, which is not attributed to the Prophet. Son. There's no, the Prophet never said, look at these things in the narrators and call it sahih. Now this is his own invention, right? But it is hasana, it enables a person to get the goal, which is the true knowledge of sunnah. Then Imam Bukhari will get the reward for that, and any and everyone who follows that till the end of time, he will get the reward for all of that as well. 
So first part of running the boxes, their position is clear cut against the Hadith in Sahih Muslim. Second, if we accept their position, that even the method must be attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so it's not just the sawwuf, every branch of Islamic learning is bidah. Let's start number one, tajweed. So the qari who comes home and teaches your children nurani qaida or ikra qaida, there's no hadith that the Prophet taught sahaba using this method. So this is a method that is not attributable to the Prophet ﷺ. They say their position, any method that is not attributable to the Prophet ﷺ is bida, dalala, go to jahannam. All those qaris and all those children are all going to jahannam because they adopted a method of learning tajweed that is not attributable to the Sayyids who say, Rasulullah Wasallam. That's their position. You have to flush out its logical consequence. Second, all tafsir is bidah. Every single tafsir scholar compiled a tafsir and put his name on it. Tafsir of Tabari, Qurtubi, Ibn Kathir, Alusi, so many of them. And that tafsir is not attributed to Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam. And you say everything in that tafsir, other than when they quote hadith, all of that is bidah. All of that is bidah, and they are going to go in the fire of Jahannam, and anybody who learned tafsir through the classical works of tafsir is going to go to the fire of Jahannam. Third, all the methods of all the hadith scholars that we shared a drop with you, of evaluating a narrator, whether he is reliable or not, all of those methods of narrator evaluation, comparative, son of analysis, every single method of every Hadith scholar is all bidah because none of those methods can be attributed to a textual report Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Therefore, all of that is also leading to the fire of Jannah. All of fiqh then, so it's not just Salafis, the position that the Salafis adopt isn't just against fiqh and tasawwuf. Tajweed gone, tafsir gone, hadith understanding gone, mufassirun gone, muhaddithin gone, qurra gone, and yes, obviously, fuqaha and fiqh also gone, because all the methods of usul, so I gave you yesterday Imam Malik's method of understanding that question, Imam Shafi's method of ijtihad, Imam Munifah's method of ijtihad, all the methods of ijtihad and methods of usul of all of the jurists are all bidah, because they're not attributed to a textual report of the Prophet wasallam. again gone. So yes, finally the, it will come to us. All the methods of the zikr of the zakirin, all the methods of sohbat al sadiqin, all the methods of all of these helping people leave sin, all the anger management programs, all the lust control programs, all of those methods, they can, those methods cannot be attributed to a textual report of the Prophet so it's bidah. So if you want to adopt their position, <laughs> try to live a life like that. Try. <laughs> It's not livable. It's, a, it's again a logical fallacy. Plus it goes against so many other texts. That's why the ulama didn't take this position. The ulama didn't take this position. Alright? So the reason I'm telling you this is just like there are methods of tajweed not found in hadith. Methods of tafsir not found in hadith. Methods of usul hadith not found in hadith. Methods of usul al not found in hadith. They're methods of zikr not found in hadith. All right. Second round on this concept of bidah. On content and method. Sometimes Allah Ta'ala, now the particular realm of ibadah, because ibadah is a bit of a special category, right? So if you think about it then, tajweed and tafsir and hadith and fiqh, those were knowledge. And so that was a method to acquire knowledge. So somebody will come and tell you this, that no, I'm fine with new methods. I'm fine with that definition of bidah when it comes to a method to acquire knowledge. In that case, all new methods are okay. The method does not have to be attributed to the Prophet ﷺ. There will be used the very test that he told you that the method must not be against the Qur'an and Hadith. As long as the method is not against the Qur'an, we will accept it as long as it's a method of acquiring knowledge. However, if when you say method, you're talking about a method of doing ibadah, a method of worshipping Allah Ta'ala, ibadah is a special category. In that case, when you're talking about ibadah, the method must come from either a text in the Qur'an or a text of Hadith. And if somebody adopts or events or teach, teaches a method of ibadah, means method of zikr, method of dua, method of any ibadah, that is not found in the Qur'an and Hadith, that method of ibadah will be called bidah. 
So it's only in ibadah that we use that test of what is a bid'ah. All right. Bring it back to the, so okay, you bring that to the scholarly tradition. We say that is half correct. That is true only for fard, wajib, and sunnah ibadah. In other words, for any ibadah that is fard, or wajib, or sunnah, that is absolutely correct, the method for that ibadah must be found in the Qur'an or the Hadith. No one can invent a method for that ibadah. No new method. However, for nafil ibadah, nafil ibadah, a person can invent a new method to do nafil ibadah as long as that method is not against the Quran and Hadith. So that definition, that it's a bidah if it's not found in the Quran and Hadith, is true for method, true for all content, and true for method of fard wajib sunnah ibadah. And that definition of bidah, that is, it's not bidah if it's not against the Qur'an Hadith, that's true for all methods of knowledge and the methods of nafil ibad. That's the position now of the scholarly tradition. So the difference now is in what? Nafil ibad. This is now, I've honed down the difference to you. Okay? Difference is in nafil ibad. All right. So before I do the slides with you, I'm going to pick two types of nafil ibad. And I'm going to pick these two types of nafil ibadah because you will also understand that these are used a lot in tazkiyah. Right? This is something the sheikhs of Sufism. I don't use, I personally can't stand the word Sufism. But I don't, because normally in the name of Sufism, a lot of things go on that are actually that other type of tasawwuf I told you, which is outside the bounds of sharia. Alright? So I rather prefer the use, use the word tasawwuf or tazkiyah. Alright? Now, these two nafil ibadah is called du'a and zikr. Right? Du'a and zikr. Du'a and zikr. So, first I will show you du'a because that slide isn't there, and then I will show you zikr because some of the slides are there, but they're also incomplete. Du'a. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, لِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna فَدْعُوهُ biha." To Allah ta'ala belong these beautiful names, Make du'a to him using these names. So now when I told you content is found in the Quran and Sunnah, content is there. Making du'a using the small husna, content is there. Method is not. So the first thing that happens in nafil ibadah, first thing to know about nafil ibadah, Faraz wajib sunnah ibadah, you cannot make a new method because the method will already be prescribed and defined in the Quran and Hadith. Therefore, if you make a new method, actually it goes back to the first test, you will be going against the Quran and Hadith because the method will already be there and you're coming up with another method. When it comes to nafil ibadah, there are going to be two types of nafil ibadah. There will be some nafil ibadah that the method to do that nafil ibadah is present in the Quran and Hadith. And the second will be that the method to do that nafil ibadah is not mentioned in Quran and Hadith. So this is an example of that nafil ibadah. There is no method mentioned in Quran and Hadith. So for example, let's say a person is reading that and says, okay, I want to make dua using smart. How am I supposed to do it? Yes, you can find one hadith in the collection of Imam At-Tirmidhi, where the Prophet sallallahu mentioned 99 names. But you should know also, those aren't the only names. If you built the whole workshop of all the verses of Quran, all the hadith, there are more than 99 names Allah has revealed to us. But okay, no problem. Let's say you take that. But in that, the Prophet sallallahu just listed 99 names. There's no mention of how to make dua. For example, should I say, Allahumma Rahman, Allahumma Rahim? Should I say, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim? Should I just say, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, and just list them? What's the method? How many times should I say it once? Can you see that? How many times should I say it once? Can I break it up? Am I supposed to say in the morning, after Salah, before Salah, any time, specific time? There is no information about the method. Now the question is why? So this example itself is a proof that Allah Ta'ala has left the method of nafil ibadah open to the ummah. It's not regulated, it's open. 
Why? Because nafil ibadah is the expression not of your submission and servitude and obedience. Because it's not required. Nafil ibadah is the expression of your own personal extra love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah ta'ala is going to let you express it how you want. How you want. So now what does it mean? What's the sharia ruling of the method of making dua of asmal husna? Any method, you can make dua of asmal husna using any method, any method, as long as that method is not against the Quran and Hadith. You understand? It, so that's a proof. This is, so again, when we're running the position, another thing, actually a third thing I didn't tell you about running the box. First is you must assess the evidences, are they from the workshop? Is the workshop taken into account? Is there any flawed, flawed reasoning, flawed argument? Is there anything in the workshop that negates that argument? Second to run the box was to flush out the logical implications and see, can I accept these necessary consequences? If I can't accept the consequence, I can't accept the position. <laughs> yes. Third, if I accept that position, is it all encompassing? Does it solve all the matters? So for example, if I accept this position that you even in nafil ibadah, you cannot adopt a new method of nafil ibadah that is not in the Quran and Hadith, there's no way you can make dua using a small husna. It will end up being nasq of this ayah. You, what you will be doing is tantamount to abrogating this ayah. Because there is no method mentioned of how to make dua with small husna. And person's position, selfie position is that you cannot use a method in the filibada except if it's mentioned in Quran Hadith. Fact. That's their position. Fact. No method on how to make the filibada of Asmaul Husna's dua is mentioned in Quran Hadith. Conclusion. I cannot make, if I accept their position, conclusion, no one in the ummah can ever do amal on this ayah of Quran because there's no method mentioned and they say you can only use a mentioned method, therefore I can't do it. Position gone. Understood? That was the third check on the box. Alright. Now, I'm going to tell you another thing and I'm going to show it to you. Even when there is a method mentioned for nafil ibadah, even when there is a method mentioned for nafil ibadah, you can add to that method as long as the addition is not against Quran and Hadith. Now this may seem to a person counterintuitive, that if there is a method mentioned, why would I add to it? You can't do that in Fard Wajib Sunnah Ibadah. Fard Wajib Sunnah Ibadah by definition method is mentioned and you cannot add to the mentioned method. Nafil Ibadah, either method not mentioned or method mentioned, even if the method is mentioned, you can add to it. Proof. So there's another dua, that was dua of Asma husna there's another dua that is mentioned in Hadith, it's called dua kunut, and this is the dua that is to be offered in Witr Salah. Salatul Witr. Now, Salatul Witr is normally prayed individually, but in Ramadan is the only time it is played congregationally in Jama'ah, and that is after Salatul Taraweeh. Now, if you were to go and see any video or hear any audio of the Salatul Taraweeh and then the Salatul Witr of any Imam, any Imam of Makkah Makarama, Madinah Maraharame, and Sharifin, you will hear what? Now there is a dua kunut of the Prophet ﷺ, few hadith that mention few of his duas. They will recite those duas in witr and then they say extra words. It's Arabic, but it's extra. They make dua to Allah Ta'ala using additional words. They make the dua kunut of witr with an additional method beyond, above and beyond the method of dua kunut mentioned in the hadith. And nobody in the world has ever said this bidah. Certainly the Saudi Salafis don't say it's bidah. Yes, this is another problem. That all teachers and all traditions are sometimes harmed by other fanatical students that they have, or fanatical followers, or fanatical attendees. And this is a big problem that we have also. And actually, jitna students ne kaam kharaab kiya na. It's often actually a Salafi student and a Sunni student who really go at it with each other. Whereas actually, meanwhile, the Salafis call and the Sunnis call love each other and eat lunch together and view each the other one's going to Jannat. <laughs> Alright? Okay. So even so, even that is an Islam. And this is not something current. The point is it's been going on. It's not something that the current Imams of Haram and Sharifain started. This has happened in the past also. 
And it is viewed, it, the scholarly position is that you can add words to the Dua Knut. The condition is it has to be in Arabic, right? But you can make more Dua to Allah Ta'ala in Arabic, in Dua Knut of your Salatu Witr, beyond the words that are mentioned and transmitted in Hadith. Why? Because that Dua is Nafa. Hanafis believe Witr itself is Wajib, but the Dua Knut is Nafa. Alright? Okay. So, two options in Nafal Ibadah. Method mentioned, method not mentioned. In both you can make additions. So first, I gave you the example of Dua. Second is the example of Zikr. Now this is just extra. Now you can understand once I showed it to you with proofs from Dua, it's clear it's going to be true for Zikr also. What's true for one Nafal Ibadah is true for a second one. It's true for Dirut Shif also. Sayyidina Rasulullah some has mentioned hadith, some wordings of salawat. You can use other words to praise him. And there have been ulama who have done that in the past, and they've written small booklets or collections of their dirud and salat. It's completely jais. That's another example of nafal ibadah. Istighfar. Hassan al-Basri used to beg Allah Ta'ala's for... There are some words of different du'as of istighfar mentioned in hadith. Hassan al-Basri, one of those great tabi'in, he used to seek Allah's forgiveness using additional words. And that actually was compiled in a book that Al-Istighfarat al-Hassan al-Basri. And the Ummah used to read it, and one of my good friends has translated that in English. Now, before I show you zikr, I want to show you another thing. So what do you do? Let's go back to the example of Dua of Asma al-Husna. You okay or no? Alright, good. Go back to the example of Dua of Asma al-Husna. So what should I do if I can't find any method? No method mentioned in the Qur'an and no mention mentioned in the Hadith. So there are two options now. Two op- option one is to go down the hierarchy. What was the hierarchy to Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Qur'an? A hierarchy. Al- and I showed you this verse already in an earlier slide in an earlier day. Alladheena an'amallahu alayhim min al nabiyina one was siddiqina two was shuhada'i three was Salihin four. The option one is if I don't find a mentioned method, a, a, a method mentioned in the Quran or the Hadith, I go to the next hierarchy. Was there any method of the Siddiqin to do this Nafal Ibadah? So I find Hassan al-Basri is istighfar. I'll make du'a asking using his method. I find Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jan is the method of making a du'a with Salah Susna. I'll use his method. So option one is to drop down the hierarchy and use the method of the Siddiqin Sadiqin on the understanding that just like the ulama who know more fiqh and are fuqaha, their methods of fiqh are better than the person who doesn't have that knowledge. Similarly, that person who had more taqwa, more zikr, the methods of zikr of the zakirin are better than me just coming up with my own method. Option two is you come up with your own method. And that is permissible in Sharia, right? As long as your method is not against the Quran, Hadith, and Sharia. But the point is the efficacy of the method. So go back to now the methods of knowledge. You can come up with your own method of tajweed. But people say what? That mahirine fanka mukarr shuda nisab kisi mahire fan se barai raas parna. That's the best me- best method. In English, it means that the experts of the field the curriculum and methods that they made on the basis of their expertise to learn that curriculum and follow those methods under a living expert teacher gives me the best, fastest, deepest results. That's why you want a qari for your child. Otherwise, every parent can develop their own method of learning tajweed and they can teach their child according to their own method. It's permissible. But we prefer to use methods of the experts and methods that have a track record of attaining the goal. Because it's a method, it's not a goal in of itself. That it reaches a person to the goal. So I would think that, okay, I want to use a small husna. Why? So I have more love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I can remember Allah ta'ala more in these different facets of his names. Now there is no method mentioned in the hadith. So I personally feel the preferred option is to go to the next level in hierarchy. Go to the method of the siddiqin, sadiqin, which is also proven, has had a track record of proven results. So then, the, just like the methods of the scholars of fiqh and usul were collected and combined, and that was called a madhab, the methods of nafal ibadah 
and the methods of tazkiyah of nafs, methods of purification of the heart, methods of zikr, methods of increasing haya, akhlaq, the methods of certain siddiqeen, sadiqeen were combined, that is called a tariqah. So when you say the tariqah of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, the tariqah of Shah Bahaudin Naqshaban, again it's not a sect, because there's no difference in theology. There's nothing to do with aqidah. It's just a methodology. So like the Hanafi madhab was a legal methodology, the Naqshabandi or Qadri Tariqa is simply a methodology of nafil ibadah and tazkiyah. That's it. Now a person can say, no, I prefer to follow my own method. No problem. <laughs> Both options are there. We feel that the preferred option is to drop the next level, Siddiqeen, or then the next level, Salihin, rather than to follow my own methods. If I follow my own method, how will I design that method? It will either be on the basis of my akal, or the basis of nafs, or the basis of ilm. And if a person doesn't have ilm, it will necessarily be on the basis of their akal or their nafs. And I've already spent earlier sessions explaining to you that the akal and nafs are not meant to be the guides in our deen. The guide in our deen is ilm. The guide in our deen is amal. The guide in our deen is ikhlas. So that person who had ilm and did the amal of zikr such that they were a zakir, and who had ikhlas, they truly loved Allah Ta'ala, I would rather take their method than follow my own method which is going to be on the basis of my akal and my nafs. So if somebody says, I'm in tariqah, naqshabandi, or silsla, qadri, it's not a sect, it's nothing. And some people make the mistake, they overstate these affiliations. It should not be so overstated. It's just like indicating a shared teacher. So like an Abdalian, that's not a new sect. That just means that two people who also studied at Hassan Abdal, or what do you call it? We call it Luminite. It means it's not a new sect in Islam. It's a word to denote a shared affinity that you studied knowledge from a common methodology, which was the way that particular institute designed its degree programs and had its faculty. What do you call IBNs? Huh? Right? Etisonian, grammarian, these are not sects. <laughs> hmm? Alright? Okay. And that's natural that people use labels to represent shared affinities. That's all they're trying to do. That's all it is. If it's not a sect, it doesn't mean that you should love your fellow Qadri more than you love an Akshabandi, you love your fellow Hanafi more than you love a Shafi. It has nothing to do. The unity is still there. But the reality is that we got a learning or followed a method to a particular thing. Sometimes an older uncle will come and introduce you to his friend and say, oh, we had the same kari when we were young. It's a shared affinity. It does create a bond. That bond is not sectarianism. That bond is not division. That bond is a social emotional reality that bonds are created by sharing teachers, sharing learning, sharing institutions, sharing methodologies. That's a natural bond that's acceptable in Sharia that should not be twistedly misportrayed and labeled as tafarraqa or tafrika or sectarianism or division or schism because it's not. All right? Now, last set of slides before we break for Salat al Jum'ah. New methods of zikr. The Sahaba and Salaf did. So this notion of the day. So if we're saying that, okay, if a method is not mentioned, you can make a new method. So the first people who would have done it should have been Sahaba, right? Obviously, Sahab, Nabi Akrasim, that means the method is mentioned, right? Method is not mentioned means he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, didn't do it. So did the Sahaba ever make new methods of zikr? That's the real presentation now I want to show you. I've got limited slides. It's enough to, to show you, but there's so much on this that you haven't, this is a huge workshop in of itself. Step one is that did they invent adopt a new method of zikr, nafil zikr, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ? Yes. Now, one answer to this is, well, the Prophet approved of it, so it becomes part of his sunnah. Yes. But the point is, he allowed them to have this thinking. Right? So I will show you example number one. So from a hadith, now we'll do this very quickly. Uh, this salah, which is known as tahiyatul wudu, so when you make wuzu to pray two rakats nafil, this was actually the invention of Sayyidina Bilal radiyal ta'ala anhu, as mentioned in the hadith of Sahih Muslim. That Sayyidina Rasul Sallam, he went to Bilal. That, oh Bilal, tell me that at the time of Fajr, what is it that you do? 
due to which you're getting this incredible roar because at night I heard the sound of when I was on Miraj. So when he came back, when Nabi Karim Sallam came back from Miraj, what does he do? He asked Bilal, what were you doing? Due to which your footsteps were falling in Jannah, this much I was informed that there's some amal that you did. There's some amal that you did the time of Fajr. So Sayyidina Bilal said that what do I do is every time I perform wudu, whether night or day, so he shared with the Prophet that it's not just something I do at Fajr time. Any time at the night or day, I've adopted this new method. You didn't teach me this. I adopted this method that any time I make wudu, I pay two rakats nafim. So Sayyidina Rasulullah said mentioning and accepted Sayyidina Sayyid Muslim that Sayyidina Bilal adopted a new method. Now what I told you, after this conversation, you can say the Prophet accepted it, so now it's sunnah. But before the conversation, it's still accepted, because that's why the Prophet the Hadith is saying, that's why, for I heard during the night the sound of your footsteps, Allah Allah accepted it. And that means the Sahaba had this understanding, that we can make a new method in Nafal Ibadah. Sayyidina Bilal never asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this. He never heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He never asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He never even told Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's clear in this hadith. So some, some people they tried to discount this and said, no, no, it's in the hadith, so it's sunnah. No, but the hadith is teaching us something. <laughs> that the Sahaba had this understanding that they can adopt a new method in Nafal Ibadah, not something they heard from the Prophet ﷺ. They don't even have to inform the Prophet ﷺ. They had this understanding, and this understanding is not corrected. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say that, Chalo, achi baat hai, mega, aindha khyal kara, aindha pooch kar chalna. He didn't say that, right? He didn't say that the Sayyidina Bala in the future, you should ask me, or at least tell me these things. He didn't say that. Alright, give you another example. Sahih Bukhari, Sayyidina Bukhari, Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was leading salah. He said, raised his head from ruku, said, Sami Allah liman hamida. On his own, he said, Rabbana alakal hamdi, heard some sahabi behind him, add extra words. So this is the example, method is mentioned. Can you add? So, Sahih Muslim is showing, no method, you can invent new method. No mention of this method, you can invent new method. It's nafil. Sahih Bukhari is showing, method is mentioned. Rabbana lakal hamd. The Prophet taught that method to Sahabi. Rabbana lakal hamd. Sahabi knows, even if method is mentioned, I can add to the mention. He says, add to the method. He says, hamdan kathiran tayyibam mubarakun fi. He adds to the mentioned method. Okay, after salah, Sayyidina Rasulullah turned back and said, who said that? So that Sahabi said, me ya Rasulullah. I said those extra words. That you never taught me and I never even asked you, is it okay for me to say these words? Yes. So the Prophet said, what? I saw 30 plus angels making haste that who would be the first one to write these words? Means your words were accepted. Now these hadith are taught. These hadith are shared. Why? It, hadith is imparting knowledge. People are being trained. This is acceptable behavior. This is acceptable. When the other sahaba hear, the Prophet some say this, they're also hearing, whoa, this is, we could add extra words and we get angels, 30 angels will come to recite. They're being trained. They're being taught. You can add extra method even to the mentioned method taught by the Prophet wasallam, as long as that method isn't against Quran and Hadith. So you got it from Sahih Bukhari, Muslim and Sahih Bukhari. Hmm? And from Quran, the Lai Asmal Husna for the Uhu Biha. So Sahaba did it, right? So it's established from the first generation of Salaf that you can have new method and you can add to even mentioned method as long as it's Nafal Ibadah. Alright? Still, they really plant this down you. No, no, but that was the time of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet knew it, he accepted it. It can't be done after the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Alright. Here, where we had slightly less... Uh, for you. Here's another one, uh, also in Sahih Bukhari, still in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, saying, Anderson and Nari, that there was a sahabi from the Ansar who used to lead Salah in Masjid Quba. He was the Imam of the Sahaba in Masjid Quba. And every time he would do the extra recitation after Fatah, he would always say, Surat Al-Ikhlas, Kulub Al-Lahad, and then add some other recitation. Every time. So the Sahabi went to them and said that, you know, why are you doing this? You should leave it. You can read the Deesas there on slide number 30 for you. I'm just summarizing it for you. 
So the Sahaba said, no, I'm not going to leave it. He said, I'm not going to leave it. If you want, I will keep leading you in Salah while doing this. means while every time after Fatah, I will recite Kulhu Kulhu Allah Allah and add some other recitation. And if you don't want it, I'll, I'll stop being your Imam. So they said, now look, the Sahaba, they did ask him a question. They were questioning this practice. But they considered him superior, more virtuous, more muttaqi, and they disliked that, no, no, nobody else should leave. You should be the Imam. Because you're wonderful, you're muttaqi, you're salah, we love bringing behind you. But we had this question. So when he came to the Prophet, when they came to the Prophet, said, they told the Prophet, so the Prophet said, call that Sahabi, that, oh, so and so, so here actually, the narrator, the Sahaba narrator didn't mention his name. Maybe out of Allah Alam for some reason. So the Prophet said, Oh, so and so Sahabi, what stopped you from doing what your companions wanted you to do? Now, why didn't you stop reciting Kulul Had after every, in every rakah, in addition to whatever else you recite? So he said, he, resp- he replied to the Prophet <laughs> Verily, I love it. <laughs> I love Surat Al Ikhlas. So the Prophet said, oh, Okay, fine. You're doing it because you love it. It will make you enter Jannah. This is the third example of Sahabi adding new method not taught, mentioned by Prophet ﷺ in the lifetime of Rasulullah ﷺ. Here, this is another one, also in Bukhari. I'll just show you the reference. Muslim, Bukhari, Bukhari, Bukhari. Hmm? Yeah? <laughs> All right. Some examples after the life. That did the Sahaba do it? After the life means they didn't get prophetic approval certification of this. Right? It never happened. After the life of Nabi Akareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sahih Bukhari. <laughs> Sahih Bukhari. Khulafai Rashidun. Sayyidina Umar radiyallahu anhu. The method of congregational tarawih. That in the time of the Prophet there was no congregational tarawih. Sayyidina Umar he saw that okay, some people are reciting tarawih behind certain qari, some people are reciting. So he gathered all of them. And look at the words Sayyidina Umar and said, what an excellent bid'a this is. This also establishes Nematul Bidah Hada. Ne'mul Bidah Hada. Ne'mul Bidah Hada. What a wonderful Bidah this is. This also establishes the Sayyidina Umar Badilat Ananhu and Imam Bukhari who narrates the hadith, and all the muhaddithin before and after him knew that the word bida can be used positively or negatively. In that hadith, when the Prophet kullu, he didn't mean this, he meant by bida, he had in his mind every wrong innovation. So the English would be every wrong innovation. Not every innovation, whether good or bad. No, no. Every wrong innovation. Here, Sayyidina Umar said, Ne'matul bida hada. That what a wonderful bidah this is that I, say Umar, have just done that I'm making everybody pray tarawi in one jama'ah behind one imam. So this is the sahaba doing a new method after the life of the Prophet wasallam, narrated in Sahih Bukhari and labeled like this that this is a good bidah. This is a good bidah. Alright? Okay, now... Clear. So the last thing, last hadith, because we have to stop at 115. So this is in the Sahih Imam Muslim. The Abdullah, he was the freed slave of Sayyida Asma binti Abi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. So she freed the slave. Okay. And he narrates that my, when I was a slave, my former mistress, she sent me to Abdullah bin Umar, the son of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Right? And she sent him to ask a question. So go ask Abdullah bin Umar on the behalf, on my behalf, means on the behalf of Asma bin Tabi Bakr, that I'm the daughter of Bakr, you're the son of Umar. Right? So I'm asking you a question. What is the question? That I've heard that number one, you have prohibited three things. That you were telling the people, Abdullah bin Umar was also one of the great ulama, faqi, muhaddis, sahabi. Right? So he was teaching the tabin a lot. Young sahabi. Like she was also young sahabi. So she says that I've heard, she says through uh, Abdullah, that I heard that you've prohibited three things. Number one, the striped thob, that don't wear clothing, jibba, which is striped. Second, that don't ride a saddle cloth, that don't put cloth over your saddle that is made of red silk. And third, that a person should not fast the entire month of Rajab. 
So this part of the deeds we're just showing you is this part. So he responded. He responded by saying, Abdullah bin Umar responded to the other Abdullah that you go back and tell Asma bin Abi Bakr that as far as this third question of yours, that you have heard that I am prohibiting fasting the month of Rajab, I am somebody who fasts continuously except for the two Eids. I fast continuously except the two Eids. So let alone, this is an expression in Arabic that's not coming clear to in the literal translation. There's another problem with translation. He means that, Aap iska kya se jo hi roza rakta hai. Right? You're asking me that I tell people they can't fast one month consecutively. I'm the one who observes continuous fasting consecutively except Eden. All right, now, who, if you don't want to take it from me, so we put it for you, because sometimes we want to show you also, I don't come up with this stuff, right? Because I'd be go, you know, he, he turned the knob a little bit over there, right? So I didn't Imam Nawiri Mulatala, who I told you is the greatest alim and greatest commentator of the Sea of Muslim, he explains that Ibn Umar, Huma's reply concerning fasting and Rajab is a denial on his part of what Asma Radanha had heard, it means I'm not telling people to forbid it, and in fact, he was affirming that I fast all of Rajab entirety, and in fact, I fast every day primarily except for the days of Eid. This continual fast is not a method taught by Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alright? So this is, and Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar is one of the leading ulama sahaba. Alright, there are several more examples. The, my favorite one, which unfortunately didn't make it to the presentation, but we'll get that to you in the reading packet, is Sayyidina Abu Huraira Vedantanu making zikr on a long rope with a knot tied in it. So a method of zikr using tasbih. <laughs> right? A method. So you find it conclusively that the Sahaba did adopt new methods. So I think this is clear enough for you on the content of Bida. The last thing we'll do after Juma is the content of Bida. So the two things people normally worry about in Tasawf, that is this Bida? And second is why I give Be'ah. Hmm? Bida is done now, and we'll talk about Be'ah after the Jum'a Salah, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair, jazakumullah khair, jazakumullah khair, jazakumullah khair, jazakumullah khair,